Hey, guys, I'm so excited to be here with you, Fresh Life. I can't tell you, I can't tell you how much I love your senior pastors. I'm telling you, I've gotten the opportunity to meet a lot of pastors around the country. And you guys already know this, but maybe you're new and don't know yet, or maybe you've been here too long and have forgotten. You have the best, the best of the best. Man, we love you. And me and Jill just cherish our relationship with you guys, and we we love and respect you so much. So thank you. Thanks for letting us come hang out. We love you guys. All right, if you're at a physical location, go ahead and have a seat. And uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to get into it. God, I thank you that you are with us. Whether we're in a building, at a watch party, in a house, in an office, on a hike, a bike, a treadmill, wherever we're at. We know that it's your presence that changes our lives. It's your word that changes our lives. And we're going to have both of those no matter where we're watching this from right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you that you're with us. We thank you that you want to speak. I pray, God, that right now you would open up our hearts and our minds to, even as new friends, be able to get into what can be a very treacherous topic. And I pray you would do something really special in our lives today, God. We ask for that in Jesus' name. And everybody at every location said, security. (laughs) I like you, you and me this whole time. Hey, so the title of today's message is, when past hurts, still hurt. When past hurts, still hurt. I'm telling you. I don't say this very often at home um, because no one listens to me anyways when I do, but I really believe this will be a really good time for you to take some notes. Um, Get your phones out. Uh, If you're on a device at home, get ready to take some screenshots. I'm telling you, this is a set of notes that I've been putting together for the last two years out of complete personal experiences and hardships. And I've been really waiting two years to preach this message and cannot wait to deliver it to you today, guys. I'm telling you, I feel like it's going to set some people free. And so so when past hurts still hurt, I just started jujitsu training with my oldest son, Ethan. Me and my wife, Jill, have three boys. And we just started jujitsu training. I call it ninja school. Levi, I can't let these 20-year-old staff members sneak up on me. You know what I'm saying? And so I started ninja school. Well, I got done with this a couple of days ago, and I was like, oh my gosh, my elbow hurts so bad. And it's obviously a sign of youth. And, um, and like, I couldn't hardly drive home. And no joke, this morning, I woke up this morning, and the first thing I thought of was, wow, my elbow hurts. Like, it hurts to the point where your senior pastor asked me, he's like, hey, tomorrow you want to play tennis? I know what he's doing, you guys. He forgets that he told me a long time ago he's really good at tennis and loves tennis, and he's inviting me to something he can destroy me at. I get the game. I don't mind getting destroyed. I would talk trash the whole time regardless. But I had to tell him, I'm like, bro, I can't. My elbow is killing me. Here's the thing. The truth is, I didn't. the injury didn't happen this week at jiu-jitsu class. I've been telling people that my elbow has been hurting for over a year. And in fact, I went to the physician. I went to an orthopedic surgeon, does all the professional teams in Denver, supposed to be one of the best. He told me exactly what to do. He goes, I know exactly what it is, and there's this thing in your elbow. And I I do this surgery a lot, especially to baseball players. It'll be perfect. And then he told me the process. And the process of surgery and recovery and all the time, I was like, nah, I don't want to do it. And so because I didn't go through this painful process, to me it sounded painful, Because I didn't go through this painful process that the physician recommended, here I am over a year later, and my past hurt still hurts. And I can't actually walk in the freedom I'd like to, because I'd really like to get beat by your pastor in tennis tomorrow. (laughs) Truthfully, I mean that. I would love to hang out and go play tennis. I don't have the freedom to do all the things I want to do, because I got a past hurt that still hurts. And you guys, you you know that our, our souls are like that, right? You know that? It's, it's why you can go from having, you ever noticed you can ha- be having one of the best days of your life, like everything in the world's going right, and all of a sudden you hear one thing, and you go from real happy to real sad in a nanosecond? You can just hear somebody's name, can't you? And all of a sudden your whole day's ruined. You see a post, you read a comment, 
You hear about an event, you drive by a place, you hear a song, and all of a sudden you can go from real happy to real sad, and you're like, what just happened? It's because that's a trigger, right? And it's telling you, "Uh uh-oh, you got a past hurt, and it hasn't been processed yet correctly, because guess what? It still hurts. Because the song you just heard wasn't that big of a deal. What that person said to you right there wasn't worth ruining your day or your week. It, it really didn't do the, it wasn't where the injury happened. It just triggered something and it reminds you I got a past hurt and it's still hurting me today and I can't walk in the freedom that I feel like I'm called to walk in. That's where we find ourselves, right? And so if you have a Bible, flip open to Ephesians chapter 4 and we're going to start in verse 31. See, what happens is, is we're broken people, and we live in a broken world, and we interact with each other. That's the recipe for a perfect storm, isn't it? That's the recipe for hurts, okay? And so what happens is, is we get hurt, and either we don't want to deal with it because it's too painful, or we don't know how, which I think is often the case. And that hurt, we don't like feeling hurt, but without knowing it, hurt turns into anger. And then anger, over time, turns into bitterness. And then bitterness turns into what the Bible calls a hardened heart. It starts to change the way we live. It changes our insecurities. It changes how we interact with people. It changes who we let into our life. It changes who we trust. It changes how we treat people. Have you ever snapped on somebody and then like 24 hours later went, yeah, that was an overreaction? (laughs) Right? And what you realize is, is they didn't show you respect or you didn't feel valued or They touched on something. It was a trigger, and they hit something. And the truth is, you weren't even snapping on them. You weren't even responding to what they said. You were responding to a hurt you've been carrying for 15 years, right? It's that past hurt that still hurts, and it changes who we are as people. And God says, I don't want you to live that way. Because it keeps you, if you do, it keeps you from doing the things I've called you to do. It keeps you from walking in the peace and the joy and the confidence I want you to walk with, right? And so he says, I got the prescription. Here it is, Ephesians 4. Get rid of all bitterness. That's what turns into the hardened heart. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. And here it is. Here's this this nasty little word. Forgiving. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. The physician says, if you want to... If you want to process this wound, I've got the answer. It's called forgiveness. And we know that just trying to do that is a painful process in and of itself. In fact, the truth is, because you don't know me that all that well, it's a good thing Levi did such a nice introduction because some of you are already mad. <laughs> and I get it. Some of you went, oh, wait, that's what he's talking about today? And I took time off to do this? I get it. Now, listen, I don't talk about this subject lightly, because what I know is as soon as you hear somebody say, you know what, you ought to do some forgiving, it starts to, emotions start happening, don't they? In fact, some of us have been wounded so bad that you hear somebody say, you ought to just forgive them. You almost want to fight, because you're like, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm up against, right? And listen, Fresh Life, no matter what location you're watching this from or listening to this from, I don't know your hurts but I know hurt, and I know it hurts. I know that, and, and I'll just give you a snapshot. My, my mom got pregnant with me when she was in high school, and my biological father found out, left. I've never met him. I've never seen him. I've, I've dealt with that. Somebody important in my life abandoned me thing my whole life. I know the pain of that. My mom was a heroin addict teenager, and, and she put me on a stranger's front porch in a car seat with a note saying, please take care of him, and went and jumped off a bridge into oncoming traffic to kill herself. I know pain. She didn't die. She survived. Everything was crushed. She got out of the hospital. She married her drug dealer. And I grew up in every kind of abuse I've ever heard of. I'm just telling you, I'm not trying to have, it's not fresh life. Have a pity party for me. I don't need a counseling session. I get those once a week. Harv, you know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> My point is, I know hurt, and I know how frustrating it can be to have somebody that you barely know go, you know what you ought to do if you want to really be set free is just forgive. 
because I know, I know what that feels like. So I don't, I don't talk about this stuff lightly, but here's what I want. It's been my prayer for you ever since Levi invited me here to do this. My prayer for you has been that today some, some digging would happen in our soul and we would get real honest and God would have a window to talk to us. He would get our attention and go, listen, I have a better life in store for you. I have some freedom and some joy and some purpose in store for you. And I want you to walk in it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through five steps of what it's, 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 we could add to it. But for me, it's been five essential steps of the forgiveness process. And in Fresh Life, it's a process, right? There are some things that happen and someone can do something or something can happen. And they go, I'm sorry. And you go, no big deal. We're done. And it's good. It was, forgiveness was an event. It just happened for deep wounds. Talking about the kind of stuff I was just talking to you when somebody leaves, when somebody hurts, when somebody abandons, when somebody abuses. I'm talking about wounds. It's not forgiving those I don't believe is an event. It's a process, right? Um, there's different kind of, our body heals different wounds differently, doesn't it? Like if, if you were to, if I were to slice my arm open, they would go to the they would stitch it up in the ER. They want to close it up so it can heal. But but if I went to the same place with a severe burn. They wouldn't, they wouldn't close it up. They, in fact, they'd scratch off the surface. They want to open it up because a severe burn is like the forgiveness process and the healing. A severe burn has to be opened up so it can heal from the inside out one layer at a time. That's what this process is like. It's not an event. What I'm talking about today is a process. I'm telling you at least the freedom, and that's what I want for you. All right, number one, write this down. The first thing we got to do if we say, OK, God, I'm going to take you up on this. I don't know what I'm getting into. I don't know if I'm going to get this right. It almost makes me mad to admit that I'm going to do this, but I'm going to take you up on it. Bless you. <laughs> Number one is acknowledge the hurt. We've got to acknowledge the hurt. It took me a lot of counseling to realize how essential this was in the forgiveness process because of the things I went through as a kid. I've spent my whole adult life either pretending they didn't happen or minimizing the effects it had on me. And I sat down with a counselor a couple years ago, and he finally said, it was, so, it was so interesting. I went to, I'm telling you a lot about my life, and we don't know each other yet. <laughs> a couple years ago, I was having a whole lot of anxiety. And, and, and I've worked with Levi through a whole bunch of this stuff. I've, he's been there for me. I've been able to be there a little bit for him. Like, it's just life. But a few years ago, I, or a couple years ago, I was having such bad panic attacks. I had to take some time off work and I had to go to this anti-anxiety, impatient counseling facility. And it was humiliating. And I felt so stupid. I'm like, I'm a pastor. I should be better. And they're like, no, you're a human. It's OK to be broke. And so anyways, I went to this thing. And one of the first guys I met with, he'd been a pastor, a counselor, a therapist, like as long as I've been alive. And he, I tell him all about my anxiety. And he sits there and listens. And I'm a wreck. And I'm crying. And I'm falling apart. And he goes, all right. And he goes, let's make a list of your grievances. I said, what? I started to forget what you got to, when I said I was going to talk about forgiveness. What? I don't, want to talk, I don't want to talk about my grievances. I don't want to talk about my past. I'm having panic attacks right now. I want to talk about this. He goes, I know. And he looked at me, and he goes, he said something so profound. He said, do you know how much anxiety-producing energy it takes for you to hold on to that unforgiveness? He said, it's killing you. He said, let's, let's talk about the people who have hurt you. And we made a list. And he said, because until you acknowledge it, until you face it, and until you feel it, you can't forgive it. So while you're still pretending it never hurt you, and while you're still pretending it didn't happen, and while you're still pretending you're too strong as an adult to be affected by what happened to you as a child, you can't forgive what you don't acknowledge. So I want you to let's talk about it. Let's, let's admit that it hurt. Let's talk about how has it changed the whole course of your life being abandoned like that? And how has it changed the way you see people being abused? you got to face it and feel it so that you can forgive it. And listen, watch this. We see Joseph doing this. And a bunch of you will know the story about Joseph. And if you have your Bible and you want to follow along, great. If not, it'll be on the screen. But Genesis 45, I'm going to read a passage here in a sec. If you're like, man, I want to read along and underline. Joseph has a story where he would be one of those guys that would have a hard time forgiving. The people who were supposed to protect him, his older brothers, abused him. And, and they sold, they, they thought that he was dad's favorite and they didn't like it. And so one day they sold him into slavery and he was taken as a slave to a foreign country as a kid. 
and would spend years and years of his life in slavery and in prison. And they went home and told dad that he died. So, I mean, you want to talk about a guy who's got some reason to hold on to some unforgiveness is Joseph. I can't get into it. You have to read it for yourself if you don't already know the story. He, God does some miraculous things with his life as he's a slave and as he's in prison. And he becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt many years later. There's a famine everywhere. So everyone has to come to Egypt to get food to stay alive. And the Pharaoh, the, the, the most powerful guy, puts Joseph in charge of all the food. So now his brothers, the very ones who sold him into slavery, now have to come beg for food from him to stay alive. I mean, you want to talk about irony, right? So that's what's happening. And we're about to watch Joseph enter the forgiveness process. Because as we're going to see, he's been holding it in. He's been thinking, I'm a powerful guy. I got a, I got a large staff. I run a big organization. A lot of people look up to me. I can't be weak. I can't let that stuff bother me. I'm past it all. And what we're about to see in a second is he wasn't. OK, watch this. They come to him for the food. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. Get everybody out of here. So there's no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly. Watch him. He's, he's facing it and feeling it. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Verse 4, Joseph said to his brothers, come close. I'm your brother. I'm the one that you sold into Egypt. And then in chapter 50, there's a verse that everybody puts on their coffee mugs. And it's that verse that says, you meant, to, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. That's Joseph talking to his brothers. What happens here is he finally says, I can't keep pretending this didn't happen. I am large and in charge, but I have to face the fact that I went through some stuff and it hurt. And I got to face it and I can feel it so I can look at my family and forgive them. And he starts crying so loud as he enters into this first part of forgiveness that you can hear him from houses away. I'm going to face it. I'm going to feel it so I can forgive it. we got to acknowledge that there was hurt. Can't forgive what you don't acknowledge, right? Second thing is, and this one's tough, it might make you angry, we got to surrender our right to punish. This is, this is huge, because I, I, I got to be honest. I've lived for several years as an adult, and, and especially as a pastor, and I went, oh, I forgive that person. Oh, I'm still going to make them pay. <laughs> don't, don't get that twisted. But I forgive them, right? You know that feeling. There's this verse that you'll probably be familiar with, and I, I needed a counselor to help me tie it to the forgiveness process. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Here's how it works in real life for us today. I was talking with a couple just a few weeks ago. And I love this couple. And some mistakes have been made on both sides of the marriage. Most recently, he made some mistakes, some big ones. She's forgiven him. And so now we're at another stage, and we're still having problems. And so I'm talking, and I said, hey, guys, I'm just going to be honest. As somebody who loves you, until you're both ready to actually forgive, this marriage is doomed. It's going to be dysfunctional. And she said, well, I have forgiven him. And I said, I know you say that. I've heard you say that. But I've also heard you guys talk. And here's what happens. Babe, I forgive you. And then we get into an argument over here about something else. And you go, oh, but can I really trust you? Because I think we've been here before, haven't we, honey? Oh, you said that that's what you were. Oh, but you've said things before that I couldn't. Isn't that right? She's forgiven him. But she continues to use the situation for leverage in the relationship, for control. And we do this. And I just told him, as, as people that I love and as friends, I just said, guys, this relationship will never work until you can actually let loose of that, that, that right you feel that you have to continue to punish. Because he'll always be the whipping boy, and you'll always be in control, and this marriage will always be dysfunctional. The only way for real reconciliation is I have to surrender my right. I'm not letting him off the hook. I'm surrendering my right to say, God, I'm not going to be the one who punishes you are. 
I'm not going to be the judge and the jury and the executioner anymore. I'm going to leave that up to you. I'm going to give away my right to punish. You know what? Before we go any further, let me just, will you guys throw up that slide? I want to quickly talk about the difference between what forgiveness is and isn't before we go any further, because these points are already getting like difficult. And I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about, especially when I hit number four, because if you haven't wanted to fight me yet, you're going to want to fight me at number four. I'm just telling you right now. Forgiveness is, go ahead and put that up. Oh, it's on this side. I know. Forgiveness is about freedom. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is about your freedom. I'll tell you what forgiveness isn't. If I look. It's not justifying their actions. See, I, I've thought forever, I can't forgive. I can't say that I'm letting you off the hook, because if I do, then it reminds me of what you did. And you might not realize how bad it was what you did. And I got to make sure you know what you did was wrong. So I can't just forgive. Because Forgiveness is not saying what you did is OK. It's not OK that you left. It's not OK that you hurt. It's not OK that you lied. It's not OK that you abused. My forgiving you doesn't justify any of those things. I'm not letting you off the hook. God says, I'll take care of the wrath. There are consequences for people who hurt my kids. But we don't have to, be a, we don't have to worry about that. Forgiveness is not a guarantee that there will be reconciliation in the relationship. And I'm going to set some people free with that here in a second. And forgiveness is not a guarantee that we're going to continue doing life together. Forgiveness is for us. Forgiveness is our Heavenly Father saying, I've got a prescription for you to, to, to layer by layer healing by healing, day by day, make sure that the hurts that happened back then don't continue to hurt you today, because I want you set free. That's what it is, OK? So we're going to acknowledge the hurt. We're going to surrender our right to punish. Now, now it gets real tough. I, can, I, can't, I can't even almost say it. Pray for him. Pray for him. What? Oh, I'll pray for him. Oh, I will pray. God, I pray you take away, and I pray you, and I pray you, and if I could control lightning I, and give him COVID twice after the vaccine, and I pray. You've heard it. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who do what? I've tried to do this before, and honestly, it's looked like this. God, would you? I can't say their name. And I'm done. You ever had that feeling? I'm going to be honest in church. When I felt real spiritual, it went like this. God, I pray. You know what they need. <laughs> this part, I, I really believe, is not so much for the person who's hurt you. It's for you. Wow. It's for me. Listen, listen, because remember what I said? That hurt, it turns to anger. And that anger turns to bitterness. And that bitterness turns to a hardened heart. And that's what starts to change the way we live. And it takes a lot of anxiety and depression producing energy to live with a hardened heart. And every time I can humble myself to be obedient to my father, to go, I'm not letting anybody off the hook. I'm not justifying anybody's actions. But I'm actually going to pray that God would bless them today. I'm actually going to pray that God would help them maybe come to full repentance and see what has happened. I'm going to pray that God God would take care of them, that he would show them the same grace I've needed 10 million times. It's so painful to pray that. But here's what happens. Every single time you pray that prayer, uh, you know, they use a lot of agricultural analogies because that's what everybody understood. It's like our hearts get hardened. And you can throw seed on hardened ground like that, but it won't produce a thing. Right? But every time I decide to pray for that person who hurt me, it's like, it's like I'm tilling that soil one layer at a time, one layer at a time, one layer at a time. And each time, my heart starts to get softer and softer and softer. And pretty soon, you can throw some seed there, and something beautiful can happen. Where, where only death and desolation was, now it can be something beautiful. That's what we want. 
It begins to soften our hearts. And God says, it's, it's, it's when your heart is in this condition that you actually have peace and joy, and you don't have to live with your soul like this all the time. He says, I can set you free from this stuff, but I want to, it's a painful process, but could you pray for that person? Who watch what will happen. Number four, be open to reconciliation. I'll be honest, this one made me real mad when I heard it. Romans 12, 18, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Because here's what I thought it meant. Honestly, I felt stuck. I felt like what God was saying is unfair. Because I've been through some things that, that have, have changed the entire course of my life and have hurt me so, so deeply. And you know what this is like, because we all live in the same world, and it's life that if I forgive this person, then I got to let them back in. And if I let them back in, they'll just hurt me again. But that's what God says I got to do. So thanks a lot for that, God. Or I've done this. Oh, I forgive them, but I'm not letting them back in my life. But I'm going to feel really guilty about that all the time. Because in my heart, I'm not really forgiving. Because if I'd really forgive, I'd let him back in. And I haven't let him back in. So I guess I don't really forgive. So I guess I don't listen to God. So now I feel guilty. And now it's like, it's like salt on the wound. I was the one who was hurt. And now I'm dealing with guilt and shame over the hurt. And it puts us in a real bad spot. And I'm telling you, this set me free. Fresh life, there is a gigantic difference between forgiveness and fellowship. They're not the same thing. Forgiveness, go ahead and put that slide up. Forgiveness, I do. That's on me. That's on you. That's what I do. I decide I'm going to acknowledge what happened. I decide with, with God's help, and I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to give you a prayer to help you do some of this stuff because it feels overwhelming. I decide to go to God and say, God, help me to surrender my right to punish. I do that. I decide to pray for the people who have hurt me, even when it's hard to even utter those words out loud. I do the forgiveness work. Fellowship, that takes two people. That takes multiple people. Fellowship happens if and only if there's true repentance. We got too many fake repentance. We got too much fake repentance in the world right now. There's too many people using the words, I'm sorry, but not actually apologizing for anything. I'm not talking about, I'm sorry that my words were misunderstood. I'm sorry if that hurt you. That apology, right? That, that, that's the crazy one, right? Because what that's saying is, is, I'm sorry you're not emotionally stable enough to handle what happened. I'm sorry that that was misunderstood. I'm so no, 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 no. An apology? Go read Genesis 45 through 50, that story of Joseph and his brothers, and you're going to see real forgiveness and real reconciliation. And it happened because his brothers came and threw themselves at his feet, and they said, what we did was wrong. We are sorry. Will you forgive me? That's an apology. An apology that you can rebuild a relationship on starts with, I was wrong. I am sorry. Will you forgive me? It's got to be true repentance. No fake repentance. You don't rebuild a relationship on fake repentance. You got to actually see change. There's got to be trust and honor and respect. And, and I'm, I'm going to give you an analogy that a counselor gave me because I was feeling really bad about this because there was someone in my life that was causing pain in our family. And I was feeling really guilty for not letting them back in my life. Excuse me. Dry mouth. And. Uh, he said, he said, let me give you an, let me give you an, an, an analogy. It's, it's, a, it's extreme, but go with me. He said, if you have someone come watch your kids, and you have those little nanny cams everywhere, and, and you're, you're watching on your phone, and all of a sudden you see him chasing your children around with an ax, and then you find out that you hired an ax murderer to be your babysitter, he goes, you can forgive that person, but you're probably not inviting him over for Thanksgiving dinner. Forgiveness and fellowship are two entirely different things. And you don't have to feel guilty for drawing that line in the sand if the things aren't present to make a relationship possible. You do the as far as it depends on you, that's the forgiveness. We have to do some things for the fellowship to be a part. And you don't just not have to feel guilty about that. There, there's some relationships where you wouldn't even be using wisdom to re-engage with. You still forgive because that's what sets you free. But it's different than the fellowship, isn't it? 
There's this general biblical theme that definitely always points us to restoration and reconciliation when possible. But even the Word of God says, but there are going to be some special times when that's just not possible. The Apostle Paul tells two guys that he's mentoring, Timothy and Titus, that he's like, you have the call of God on your life, and you have been, you've been letting some people back into your life that it's causing you more harm than good, and you got to stop it. Here's what he says. Here's what he says to Timothy. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must, here it is, must be gently instructed. That's fruits of the Spirit. That's not, I'm going to tell you what you did. I, I'm going to get you. No, it's gently, with peace, patience, love, kindness, mercy, goodness, self-control, with the fruits of the Spirit. I'm going to, to the best of my ability. I might have to wait a few days before I can tell you that you hurt me so that I can find some fruits of the Spirit somewhere. <laughs> right? You know that feeling. I got to wait a few days. I don't have any right now. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to come to you with the fruits of the Spirit, and I'm going to gently, in hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That's the goal. My hope is if I can gently tell you you hurt me, and with the right spirit, with the fruits of the Spirit, give you a chance to repent, maybe we got something to build on. Maybe. He tells Titus, he gives Titus the three-strike rule. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. Because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. You know what? If they hurt you again, go warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. Everything I can do as it depends on me, I'm going to work towards reconciliation. But there's just some special cases. Oftentimes, it's things like where addictions are involved, or, or mental health is involved, or abuse is involved. There's just some times where it's like, I, I don't have to have the fellowship, but for my own future, for my own freedom, I got to have the forgiveness. That's the difference. And I believe this is so difficult that we have to pray for divine strength and healing and freedom. We got to get God involved in the process. This stuff's too difficult to do on our own. Listen, if you could do this on your own, you already would have. I'm telling you, this stuff hit me so hard when I started learning it, because if I'd have, if I'd have found this freedom on my own, I already would have. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, in my heart, in my soul, helping me to walk through these steps. Because you know the deal. It's like, it's like there's this glass wall between us and forgiveness, or between us and the freedom we want from what happened. And it's like, I just don't know how to get there. We need the power of God to help us get there. Jesus was teaching his best friends how to pray. And uh, he said, guys, he talked about an everyday prayer with them. We now call it the Lord's Prayer. And remember, there's a line in there that says, forgive me of my trespasses because I'm working on forgiving other people of their trespasses. And he said, this is so hard to do. You need to pray about it every single day. I mean, that's an interesting thing to make part of the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Jesus goes, no, 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 no. I, I've, I've been hurt like you've been hurt. I know betrayal. <laughs> Some of you are a part of it. I know pain. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to need God to help you get through this stuff. Would you put up those four verses real quick? Take a screenshot of these. I think you're going to see them two at a time. These are why praying about this stuff is so important. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And listen, the God of love and peace will be with you. God says, when you are willing to walk through this painful process, there is freedom on the other side, and it's peace. It's the stuff you've been craving like crazy. There's peace I want you to experience, and it happens on the backside of being obedient and walking through the forgiveness process. My grace is sufficient for you, he says. My power is made perfect in weakness. If you're like me, you go, I seriously don't have the strength to get into this. I don't have what it takes to dive back into what happened and to face it and to feel it so that I can forgive. I just can't. I'm not strong enough. I can't get rid of this right to punish. I want to hurt him so bad. I think about it every day. I can't, I can't know how to give that up. He says, I know. And when you're at your weakest, he says, I'm at my strongest. Let me in. Let me do in you what can't be done otherwise. 
right? Because Jesus looked at him and said, with, with man, this is impossible. But with God, I get you through what you don't think you can get through. Let me in. I got you. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the heaven. There is power and you know this fresh life. There is power in the name of Jesus. Strongholds fall down in the name of Jesus. Everything in heaven, earth and underneath it and hell and everywhere else bows at the name of Jesus. We can get through something that feels impossible when we start declaring in faith according to the name of Jesus. Three years ago, my doctor said I needed to have a rotator cuff surgery. I didn't want to do it. He explained the process. I was so desperate for change. I said, okay, let's do it. And I went through, because I couldn't play with my kids. I couldn't do the things I wanted. And being a dad's been a dream of mine my whole life. And, and so I went through it and it was, a, it was a horrible surgery. And I woke up and I had all kinds of reactions with the medicine and I had to wear a sling for six weeks and I had to go through therapy for months. It was a process. But Fresh Life this past week, even with a sore elbow, I played basketball with Ashton. I lifted weights with Austin and I went to ninja school with Ethan. I'm walking in my dreams. I'm walking in my calling and I'm doing so free because I went through the painful process. That's where God wants you with this forgiveness stuff. He wants to put what happened in the rear view mirror. Let's get rid of it. Let's get past it. You don't get to hurt me anymore. I am free by the powerful name of Jesus. All right, I'm going to give you a prayer. Would you take your phones out and take some screenshots if you're at a campus? If you're watching this on your phone or computer, take a screenshot. I'm going to give you about 15, 20 seconds to get this. Am I in your way here? No, you got it. This is a prayer that some pastors helped me write for myself, and I want to share it with you today, Fresh Life. This is how we begin to, de to declare our freedom in this area. It's like what we did as a country. You can take that slide down. If, if they didn't get it, you had to hit rewind. <laughs> it's like what we've done as a country, right? We signed the Declaration of Independence, and then we went to war. We said, I am free. I declare it, and now I'm going to go get it. That's what I want you to do in this area, because this has held some of you captive for so long. I know what it feels like to live with this stuff for decades and feel like a prisoner. But I've, I'm learning what it feels like to be free, fresh life, and I want this for you. All right, let's go through this prayer together. God, I'm ready. I'm ready to stop pretending like pain in my past is not affecting my present. Oh, this is so huge, guys. God, would you forgive me? for holding on to unforgiveness because I made all kinds of excuses and I got all kinds of reasons, but I want to get gut level honest. I have held on to unforgiveness and I got to repent, right? Please forgive me for holding on to unforgiveness. Today, I declare I'm getting rid of this unforgiveness and letting go of this hurt and anger. I completely forgive and you put whoever you need to in there in Jesus' name, because that's the only way I know how to go. I need the power of Jesus to do this one. I thank you that you are healing these wounds that were inflicted. You just pray that daily. You're healing, you're healing, you're healing, you're healing these wounds that were inflicted. And from the inside out, layer by layer, expect healing to come. I thank you that you're making me whole and you're setting me free. I declare that I'm giving up my right to judge or punish this person. I completely forgive. It's in your hands now. In Jesus' powerful name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to start to see some freedom. You know this feeling. There's like a glass wall. It's like, that's where I want to be. I can't seem to get there. I want to let loose. I can't seem to let go. I want to acknowledge it. I can't seem to face it. I want to forgive. I can't seem to let go of my right to punish. I'm telling you today, some walls are going to break. In Jesus' name, we're going to start to experience some freedom. You deserve it, Fresh Life. You deserve freedom. God, we pray right now by your powerful name that you would break some chains, break down some walls, 
set some people free. God, I pray that it would feel right now all over the world as people are watching and listening to this. It would feel like they're stepping out from under a squat rack right now. And I can breathe and I feel light and I feel hopeful in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. For the first time, maybe in years, I have hope for my future. I believe in you for my future, and I'm going to go chase it down in Jesus' name. And everybody said, 